Hey, this is Henry, and welcome to today's tutorial. What we're going to be doing today is building a simple authentication and authorization system with JWT with the Pern stack. In case you don't know what the Pern stack stands for, that's Postgres, Express, React.js as a front end, and then Node.js as their back end language. So before I, a little, I talk a little bit too much, let's just kind of jump into this. So currently, this is a user in our database, so I got to add someone new. So let's just use my own account. And let's just use a simple password. And then I'm just going to put my name inside there. So now I'm trying to register myself. If I click submit, it's going to tell me, oh no, I'm not going to save that, that I registered successfully. And you can see here that I have a dashboard that's a private route. And then it just simply displays my name over here. Now, of course, if you're building like other application, it's not going to be this simple. Uh, but just for now, uh, just for you guys to understand how JWT works with Postgres, uh, we're going to keep it this way. Then you can log out, which is going to clear my token. And then also, if I decide to log in again with my account, and I put in my password, and I can go back inside the system. And also, if I decide to go back into login, it's going to tell me or it's going to redirect me back into my dashboard because I'm authenticated. And then if I log out, vice versa, if I try to go to the dashboard without being authorized or authenticated, sorry, then I'm going to see quickly that I get back into login because I'm not allowed to go there. All right. So uh, like I said, again, this is going to be focusing a lot towards GWT. So what are you going to expect at the end of this course? Well, you're going to hopefully have a better understanding how GWT works really understand how to do authorization and authentication with JWT with the print stack. Okay, so I do want to say though that I don't touch base with any state management systems like Redux or like Context API. And the reason for that is because I feel like authorization and authentication is generally a pretty hard topic to kind of get down. So I just really want you guys to really understand the concepts, really understand how to create this little private route along with login and register routes. So you can really go on to like start using Redux or Context API because generally like the JWT system works the same way. Like it just really depends on how you want to store it. So in our case, we're going to be storing our JWT token within our local storage. So in case you are curious of what that's going to look like. Okay, so let's kind of open this up really quick. So if you go over here, this is what I mean. Like there's so many ways to store it. You can store it in local storage, session storage, or cookies. In our case, we're going to be storing it in local storage. And then you can see here, see if I can get this open for you guys. Okay, so I have nothing over here, but now if I click submit, you're going to see that token pops up and that right there is my GWT token. And that's what allows us to be authorized inside the system and to get our data. All right. Okay, and uh, before we go to the next section, I do want to tell you that there is going to be some prerequisites, okay? So the first thing is, is that you should already have Node.js installed onto your computer. And along with that, you already should have Postgres installed. Uh, now, if you don't have it, I'm going to link down a video that shows you how to install it properly. And it's a really great video. So I'll just put that below and then you guys can check it out and just come back to this video. Okay, so in the next section, we're going to understand how JWT works and know the difference between authorization and authentication. So I'll see you then. All right, so let's just kind of start talking about the theoretical aspect when it comes to JWT. Now, if you're someone who already knows JWT authentication and authorization, <clears throat> then like totally you can skip this part. I am going to provide timestamps where you guys can skip to different sections. So anyway, if you don't have any idea of that, um, I'm just going to give you guys a brief explanation and a little idea of how JWT works. So in order to understand JWT, we need to understand the difference between authentication and authorization. So authentication is the process of checking if you really are the person that you claim to be. And then authorization, which comes after authentication, is the process of checking of depending on your status, depending on your credentials, what are you allowed to do? So let's put it in question terms to make it easier. If I'm trying to do authentication, what I will be asking is, are you really Henry? And then for authorization, the question I'll be asking is, what are you able to do? Are you able to access this private route or are you able to do this? Right? It's those type of questions. 
Now, if it's still a little bit confusing, I have this little diagram, which hopefully could kind of clean a little things up. So what I have here is this family bar. And then I have my friend Gage, who's with me right now. And what we're trying to do is that we're wanting to access this family bar, which is open to anyone. And then inside this family bar is this drinking bar. And the only way to access that is that you have to be 21 and older. And just a little heads up, Gage is about 22 years old. And as for me, I'm like 18. So I'm like, oh, I'm not able to access that drinking bar over there. Okay, so anyway, I talked to this guard. The guard's like, okay, what's y'all's names? I replied to him by saying that my name's Henry. And then Gage replies back by saying his name is Gage. And the guard's like, okay, well, I need to see some identity to make sure you guys are right. So we pass over our driver's license and he looks at it and he's like, yeah, you guys are pretty legit. Um, yeah, you guys are good to go. And then he gives us some wristbands so we can enter inside the family bar. And I know this is going to look a little bit weird. I didn't know how to make it too small, so I just put it around their belly. So uh, I did this. <laughs> okay, so we have a wristbands or I guess you could say wrist bellies. And now we have access to the family bar. So now we're authorized to enter the family bar. So this is a little confusing, but here's the thing. When the guard was checking our identity, when he was making sure that we really were the person that we claimed to be, that is authentication. And afterwards, he gave us wristbands. And then we use that wristbands as a way to be authorized to enter the family bar. Okay, now we're authorized to enter the family bar. We have access to it. So now that we're inside the family bar, you know, we're partying for about one hour, and then Gage tells me that he's feeling a little bit thirsty, that he needs to go to like some drinking bar to get like a few whiskeys or something. So Gage talks to this guard, and the guard's like, oh, okay, let me look at your wristband. So the thing about the wristband is that it contains three data. It contains, first of all, your name, the second thing is your age, and the third one is the guard's signature, which is coming from here. The reason why it's important to have a guard signature is because it ensures that the wristband is actually real. Because anybody can write a wristband and just go inside the family bar or the drinking bar. So the signature is the only way to make sure that the bar, well, to make sure the band, the wristband, is valid. So the guard looks at Gage and he's like, yeah, you're like older than 21, so you're totally authorized to enter the drinking bar. So Gage gets to go inside here. And as for me, since I'm under 21 years old, I'm not authorized to go inside there because my age shows 18 years old. Okay, so that's really how authentication and authorization works. Again, authentication is the process of checking of whether you really are the person that you claim to be. And then authorization is, depending on your credentials, what are you capable of doing? What can you do? Okay, so we first went to the guard. We had to authenticate ourselves, and then we got bans. And after getting those bands, we were authorized to enter the family bar. And then for this drinking bar, Gage was the only person that was authorized to go to the drinking bar because he was older than 21 years old. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. If it doesn't, I promise you, like, once we start coding, it's going to start click. Okay, so now after that, let's just get a little closer look at that band of Henry's. So I'm going to go down. Okay, so this is the band. So we're just having a little closer up. So the band has my name, like I mentioned. It also has my age, which is 18 years old. And then it has this signature that's coming from the guard, All right? And remember, the signature is really important because if we didn't have that, someone could definitely just duplicate this and then like not have a signature and they can just lie. So for example, I could lie and just say that I'm like, I don't know, like 25 years old. And now I have access to go into that drinking bar, which is not good, okay? So this is essentially how JWT works. JWT is this idea where you contain information on something. So you're, you're given information about yourself, and then you give that information to the person or to the application to look into. So you give them the data, and you're the one that's carrying it. So hopefully that does make a little bit more sense of the how JWT works. I do want to make it clear that JWT is not there for authentication. JWT only happens for authorization. So remember, we just got the bands after authentication from the guard. That's essentially how JWT starts to work. So once we get those bands and then we start using those wristbands, that is JWT doing its work. And this is what it looks like. So if you have a little idea of how JWT works, let's kind of jump into the actual website so we can have a better explanation of what it is. So JSON Web Token. Okay, let's just kind of skip to the interactive part. 
So as you see here, this is definitely not a wristband. In fact, it's a weird looking token with a lot of encrypted things inside there. And even though it looks very scary, it's not as bad as you think. As you can see, the JWT token is split up into three parts. It's split it up to header. The second part is paid is the payload. So the payload, as you can see here, is all the data about the person. And if it makes it a little bit easier for you guys, how about I do this? All right, so 25, and this is going to be the age. And uh, yeah, let's keep it like that. So we have the name and we have the age that's being contained inside here. And then we have the header. And then the last part over here is the signature. So if you remember, we have our payload and then we have our signature data. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. So essentially, this thing right here contains all the information inside our JWT token, right? Our payload, our header, and our Vertify signature. Now, one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have with JWT is they think that JWT's purpose is to send in secret information to the client and to the server side. That's not true at all. The reason we use JWT is because we want to make sure that the person that we're interacting with is real, not fake. Okay, that's the main purpose of JWT, and I can prove it. Look, if we look inside here, so I can just open my, uh, so I was looking at the Stack Overflow posts, and these are the things that we can use to encrypt this thing easily, right? The thing about these things, of the header and the payload, is that what they're really encrypted as, this is base64. And as you know for base64, you can decrypt it easily. So if I open my inspect over here and I go over to my console, I'm just going to clear a few things. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this method from the window object. I think it was called ATOB. There we go. What I can do is I can take this data right here and I can just stuff it inside and check this out. Does this look familiar in some way? It's the same exact object that we just defined inside there. And look at this. If I decide to take this thing right there and I defined ATOB, the method again, and I put it inside, what's this? I have the same exact object. So really what we're doing is that we're just passing objects, right? The reason why we actually use like base64, why we convert to base64 isn't a way to encrypt it. It's just simply there to make it easier to transport the information. Okay, so if the purpose is not to like share secret information to each other, then like how does this make this JWT stuff special and why do a lot of people use it? Well, like I said again, JWT is simply there to verify that the person that's interacting with your application isn't fake. And this is kind of where the signature comes in. Remember how we said that we needed to have a signature because we want to make sure that persons can't just simply just add their payload and just simply get into the application. We need them to specify a signature to ensure that the wristband is real. So that's the same exact purpose of why we have to have the signature. Now, this is actually a little bit interesting because this signature is formed in a very unique way. So you probably are still figuring out what this header stuff is. And essentially, this represents algorithm. So the algorithm is the way of how the signature was signed. Right? Like I said, again, I'm not going to go too in-depth into cryptology. Uh, but what you need to know is that this thing was signed with this type of algorithm. Now, the way how a signature is formulated is it takes the base64 encoded header, so this thing, so remember we created that, plus dot, so that dot over there, plus the base64 URL encoded payload of this thing. I'm going to put that there. And then uh, you can see we have a dot as well. And then we have the signature. So the signature is taking the combination of these two things, and then it's also going to take in a secret key. Okay, so where does this secret key come from? So the JWT stuff is super secure because the only way to access the secret key is only going into our server. The only way for a client, a person on the client side to hack into our application is to know our secret key. But the thing is, is that our secret key is hidden within our backend application. I'll show it to you. If we go over to, let's see if I can find it, this application. So let's go back into the application and let's go into .emv, which is our secret information. And you can see here that I have in my server side a secret key called cat123, which is a really bad secret key. But um, yeah, we'll talk about that later. But essentially, this is my secret key. And that is the only way for this thing to actually make it valid. So that's why JWTs are quite secure, right? Because the only way for someone to like pass in a fake JWT token is to know the secret key 
But of course, if your like secret key is super bad, like cat one two three, and you can just see straight up <laughs> that JWT is like, hey, that's a weak secret, which it is. If you have a really bad secret, then people can just easily like create their own algorithm. They can create their own header. They can create their own payload, and then they can like use your weak secret key, and then they can like asset access your application, right? So you want to make sure that this thing is super like complex. That it's it's not going to be able to get guessed. Okay, so uh, hopefully that clarifies a lot of things, but that's the big idea of JWT, right? So we're simply passing this token to make sure that the person that we're actually trying to be serviced for is legit and they're real. So hopefully that answers a few of your questions. Now, if you're someone who is really interested in JWT and you want to look more in depth with some of the theories, then I highly recommend that you watch the YouTube channel Java Brains. So Java Brain is this guy that does like a lot of cool videos, tutorials, talks a lot about theory. But one of the things he talks about is JWT and he does like a two part video series. Uh, I actually, I don't know, maybe three. And it goes really in depth of like how JWT and like cookie sessions works. So anyway, uh, like uh, besides all of that, in the next section, what we're going to start doing is just having a little preview of the application so you can get you guys ready to build this application. So I'll see you then. All right, so let's see what the end goal code is going to look like. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because a lot of times when I'm teaching people or students, I realize that they get super overwhelmed of the entire application, right? Because they don't know how it's going to be built. So I want to mentally prepare you guys of what's going to happen within the client and server folder. Well, actually mainly the server folder because that's where a lot of the nasty thing comes in. Anyway, um, as you can see here, it's, it's really not as bad as you think. It just contains a simple client server folder. And then if I open this thing up, oh, my dog's barking. Um, if I open this thing up, you can see right here that I have this utils folder, which is a function that's being used by a lot of other routes. And if I open this up, this is essentially what's going to generate my JWT token. All right. So if you recognize this pattern, check this out. It contains the payload. And it also contains the secret that I'm putting inside here. And I almost left off, but it also has a expiration date. The reason why expiration date is really good and why it's important is because if you don't set an expiration date, then that person can enter your application an unlimited amount of times, which makes it more likely that your application is going to get hacked in some way. Okay, so you want to make sure you set an expiration date. Okay, um, besides that, if we look inside the routes and we look into JWT off, so this is where our register is going to, oh my God, I just spelled that so bad. But anyway, you can see this is where we do our registering. And then you can see here, this is where we do our login. So register and login is very similar. The big idea is that we're going to take in the email name password. We're going to destructure it from the request.body. Now, if this is getting a little bit scary for you, then I recommend that you look into RESTful APIs for the Pern stack. I have a video. Uh, that builds a to-do list. So you could definitely check this out if this is becoming a little bit too overwhelming for you. But anyway, so right here, we are going to get the user. So we're going to say select all from user where the user email equals to this thing right there. The reason why we want to do that is because we want to make sure that we're registering someone that is totally new, that has never been to our application, that's not saving our database yet. Because it's pointless to register someone if they're already inside our application. So if the user that rose that length is the war is greater than zero, that means we have a user that already exists. Okay, but if all of that turns out to be okay, then we're gonna move on to the next step, which is going to encrypt our passwords. So what this means is that we are going to take in the password that we have over here. We're going to encrypt it by having a salt in our original password. And then we're going to use this new bcrypt password and we're going to insert it within our database. So you can see here that we're inserting a new user with the name, with the email, and then with the newly bcrypt password. And then this is kind of where JWT comes in. So as you can see here, this is our JWT generator that I just talked about. So let me open both of them up. So it's going to be passing in a request that rows user.id. And once it gets that ID, it's going to use that as a payload. So remember, we need to get some sort of data from the person. And then it's going to take our secret and then set an expiration date. And then we're going to send it back by doing, wait, where is it at? Oh, by doing res.json JWT token, right? It's that simple. 
And then if everything fails, then we just res that status server error. All right. Now login is very similar. Uh, yeah, as you can see here, it's the same as that code. And then what we do at the end of the day is that we generate a JWT token, which is the same exact method as the last one. All right. So as you can see here, we were showing you how we generate JW token, but how do we verify whether or not the token is legit? So this is kind of where this middleware comes in. So you can see I created a middleware called authorize.js. You can see it right there. So let's look into our dashboard. Remember, we're going to hit this route when we hit the dashboard route and we want to be able to get information about that person. So you can see in order to get this information, we need to first be authorized. So this is really why I told you it's important to understand the difference between them. So I want to authorize this person. Do they even have access to this? So what I'm going to do, as you can see, it's at my middleware authorized. So let's open that thing up really quick. Now we look into it. Check this out. We're actually having this token. So remember, every time we're doing a fetch or Axios request, what we're doing is that we're saying that token and it's going to contain a header inside there. So in this case, we called it JWT token. So let's see if I can, yeah, well, that happens in the client side. But anyway, uh, essentially it becomes JWT token. We see if we can access it. If the token doesn't exist, straight up, we're gonna see authorization denied. But besides that, if everything ends up working, we're going to do JWT.verify and we're going to take in the original token and then we're gonna have the secret key because remember the secret key is only going to be found at our server site. So we have the only key to access that. And then if it turns out the person is verified, then we're just gonna set request that user to verify that user to get this data. Because remember we passed that user inside there. So now we have access to it. Okay, a little overwhelming, but like I said, again, uh, this is, you're doing well, you're going to actually start understanding it when you start building this application. All right, so that's the big step because now that they're verified, if we go back to dashboard, you can see now that I'm able to access that request that user that ID. Why? Because if you look back here, I set the request that user to that verified user, and that essentially is the user that ID. So if I go back inside here, you can see that I'm setting select username from user where user ID equals to that request that user. So I'm using information that's being given to me. And then I can just easily access in the database without putting too much like energy into it. So that's actually pretty darn cool. So that's really how GWT works. And then the client side, like I said, again, it's, it's not too complicated. You'll figure it out. Okay. So in the next section, we are going to finally start coding the server side. So I'll see you then. Okay. Okay. I finally am done talking. Let's start doing some actual programming. Uh, let's start building the server side application. Okay, so remember, you visually have an understanding what's going to look like. So I'm going to say McDeer server. So once I create that server, I'm going to cd into that server right there. And then I am going to npm init dash y. So I'm going to go quick on the RESTful API, like just the easy concepts of building express routes. But for the GWT, I'll make sure that I explain it well with you guys. Oh man, this is actually taking a long time. Okay. So I create an npm init dash y because I want to keep track of my packages. And what I'm going to do is npm install express. Then I'm going to install cores, then pg, json web token. And then what else? Uh, bcrypt. And I think that's really all we need, honestly. Now, if I install these things, I'll just give you guys a brief explanation for each one of them. Express is there just to like build a server really quick on Node.js course allows our different domain applications to interact with each other. PG allows us to interact with our Postgrad database. JSON Web Token is a way for us to generate our JSON Web Token, being able to verify it as you saw in our last application. And then Bcrypt is a way to encrypt our password so it doesn't just show like plainly in our database, All right? So in the meantime, this thing is downloading. Oh man, this is going a little bit slower than usual. Uh, yeah, I think I might as well show you guys the database then if that's the case. <laughs> okay, so just to get you guys prepped up, remember, if you want to get inside your command line, you have to say psql-u. You want to specify your user, which in my case, I'm going to use the default Postgres because everyone starts with it. And then it's going to tell me to put my password. So I'm going to say my password. Whoa, why is it slow? Okay, now I'm inside my password over there. 
And just to kind of get you guys ready while this thing is downloading, some simple commands that we're going to be using is that if you want to see all databases slash L, so you can see that this is all my database over here. And then if you want to move inside to a database, so let's say we're interested with S3 tutorial, I could just do a slash C S3 tutorial. And then I can go inside that database right there. All right. So now that that's all set up, let's go down here. Okay, finally, it's done loading. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch index.js. So this is going to be the glue of our application that's going to put everything together. I'm going to click on this one. So const express, we have express library, and we want to put that in the app so we can actually make this app have all the methods to create cool servers. And I'm going to do app.listen because I need to listen to a port number. Is uh is running for five thousand. Okay, so now that I have that thing set up, I'm going to get some of our middlewares all set up as well. So in order to actually get our cores library ready, we have to do app.use, and we're going to start running the course. So now our backend can interact with our front end, and then also just a heads up, so I don't have to do this. I'm going to set this thing up. So anytime you want to access data from the client side, you're going to have to access request.body, and this code allows us to do that, to access this part. All right. And just to keep it more organized, this is where our routes are going to be located at. All right. Okay. So we have a server that's all set up. So let's test it out. I'm going to do nomon index. Essentially what nomon index does is that it watches your file. So anytime you want to do changes, you can just simply do control S, save the changes without turning off your server and turning it back on. Okay, so everything's working, server's running on port 5000. Okay, next up is, is that I have to create a database. So I'm going to open this thing up, new file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say database.sql. So you don't have to do this, but this is just a way to make it more visually pleasing to write your code. So I recommend it. So in order to actually start this, we have to create a database. So we're going to run the command create database. And what I'm going to call it is JWT uh, tutorial. We'll call it JWT tutorial. Don't forget your semicolon. So this is what we use to create a database. And then I need to create a table within that database that's going to collect users. Now I don't stop there because I also have to specify the scheme of the users because I simply don't want to add anything inside there. So the schema for this user is going to contain uh, about four things or five no it's going to be four things so we're going to first have a user id so the user id is there to make sure that each user is unique so it, it can actually there's no duplicates so there's not going to be any clashing between the data and then we're going to set this as our primary key so this may look a little bit interesting but back then if you looked at my last tutorial i did serial primary key and what this does is that it essentially sets this as the primary key and it increments that number so it ensures that there's no duplicates. But there's actually a better way of doing this. Well, in my opinion. I can just get my application up here. So this is the serial primary key, but what I'm going to show you guys inside here is that what you can do instead is that you can do UUID. And remember, if you look into my database right there, uh-oh. Uh, you know what, I'll just go to a, just a random application. I'll just go to my demo. Call again. Okay, so I have to do slash L. It's called JWT off. So I'll go there. And then I could just do select all from users. And then you can see here that, oh. Okay, now as you can see here that we have this random UUID over there. So this is what UIE does. It basically creates a very complex, oh, sorry, not complex, but it makes this really randomized string that is really hard to guess, essentially. So it ensures that there's no clashing between the data. So what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of say serial primary key, I'm going to say UID primary key, exactly what I have on this side. And then I'm going to set the default. So this is going to look kind of cool. UUID generate v4 what is this so as you can see here and probably this is totally new to you guys but you probably have never seen me put like functions within oh 
sorry, did I call this database? Table. Yeah, create table users. But essentially, you can see that this is a function that's going to be running to create that UUID. So we can't actually do this quite yet. In order for this to function, we need to be able to download an extension. So I'm going to set a reminder to download Okay, so let's just kind of finish our schema. So if I go inside here, username, and I say varchar255, and I say not null, and I say user email, varchar255, not null. So I want my user to have username, email. The reason I'm saying not null is because it'd be pointless to kind of save this person if it's going to be empty. So yeah. So let me show you why this is not going to work. If I take this data over here, well, actually I have to <laughs> create my database first. So I'm going to take this thing right there. I'm going to open this thing up. And then I'm going to create my database by control F, sorry, control V. So create database JWT tutorials. I'm going to click enter. It's going to tell me database is created. Uh, anytime soon it will. Okay, that's strange. Oh, okay. Yeah, it finally works. Okay, it's just my computer is just lagging for some reason, but now it's creating the database. So now if I do slash L, you can see that it should pop up right around there. You see that? Cool beans. All right, so let's go out of this thing really quick. So now I can do slash C and then I can move into my JWT tutorial. All right. So now that I'm inside here, if I decide to take my database schema, look, something interesting happens. No function matches that given name and argument type. You might need to add explicit typecasts. Okay, like this is really not helpful to us in not a lot of ways, but I think one of the biggest thing it talks about is that this function is basically unrecognizable. And the reason is, is because we don't have the proper extension for this function to work. So how do we do this? So we have to download a extension that's called UUID OSSN, uh, I think. I don't know. I haven't downloaded that for a long time. Uh, let me see. I keep forgetting anyway. Uh, let's just see this. Oh, there it is. So uh, we have to download extension within our database. So we have to download this UUID dash OSP. So you have never downloaded extension, then you're in the right place because I'm going to show you guys how to do that. So we are going to go inside here. Let's bring this to the side and I'm going to take this data right here and I'm going to put it right here. And look at this. Create extension. So now we have this extension. So now we can run that function. So if I, oh, actually, I don't, I just started realizing this, but I hope this thing's not too small for you guys. So let me just kind of increase the size. A little bit all right hopefully that's a little bit better okay so anyway now if i take this right here and i put inside here look at this it creates the table because now we're allowed to run this function so if i actually look at the relationship so i can say select all from users so you could see oops let me just turn it off so you can see that this is the structure that we set up right there. And if you're still a little bit confused, I'm just going to set some sample data. So I'm just going to say um, insert fake users. Well, they're all fake users, but whatever. So what I'm going to say is insert into users. So I have to specify the table. And the columns I want to hit is username, user email, and user password. Okay. And now that I have that set up, now I need to set the values of this thing. So the username is going to be, let's say, Henry. And let's say my password, or my email is 213gmail.com. And then my password is going to be kthl822. Okay, and then I have to add a password. So the reason I don't have to specify the user ID is because it's automatically going to generate it by default. If I don't specify it, of course. So if I take this right there, and I put this inside here, Look at this. Now if I select all from users. Oh no. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna just keep turning these things on. 
you can see right here that I have this random generated UUID over there. Pretty cool. And of course, our stuff isn't bcrypt yet, so we're going to work on that later. But you can see that we added a user now, and we're able to access this UUID. So awesome. Yeah, so everything is working out so far so good. So we created a database along the table. We have a server ready. So the next step is that we need to connect our server with our database. So how do we do that? So we use that PG library that we downloaded. So I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call it db.js. So this is what's going to help us connect and smush everything together. I'm going to say const pull. It's going to take in that library, pg, and we're going to use this thing called, this property called pool, which essentially what it allows us is to configure our connection. So I'm going to instant this thing, new pool. And inside there, I'm going to configure how and where we're going to connect to this database. So first I have to specify the user, which by default is going to be Postgres. Uh, well, not by default, you can always specify it, but I'm just going to leave it at Postgres. And I have my password, which is going to be KTHL822. And then I have my, what's it? My host, which is going to be local host. And then I also am going to add in my port. So Postgres automatically runs in port 5432. So keep that in mind. And then we're going to have the database. This is important because the database that we created, we have to specify where we want to get it from. So remember, we called this JWT tutorials. So therefore, we have to call it JWT tutorials. And look at that. That's really all you need to do to start connecting your database together. Like, how easy is that? It's not that bad. So we have this pool over here. And this is what we're going to be using inside our routes to manipulate data. So we're, we're talking about updating, inputting, uh, deleting. It's all going to be coming from this pool over there. So in the next section, we're going to start building our routes. So I'll see you then. Okay, so I just want to give you guys a quick update. It shouldn't be single quotations. If you were to do it this way, you won't be able to add the data. So it won't work. It has to be single quotations. Uh, so yeah, just keep that in mind. So anyway, uh, when we're starting to build this routes, so I, what I did right here is that I created a folder called routes. So you know what, I'll let's start with you guys. So I'll create a new folder called routes. And inside there, I'm going to create a new file that's going to call, uh, let's call it jwtauth.js. So kind of like the last application. And inside there, we're going to use something called router. Uh, the big idea is, is that if you want to make your express routers or your routes more modular, you'll want to use routers because it allows you to like break down your routes and then combine them all together within this index.js file. So I'll show you what I mean. So const router, and then we're going to say require express. And then inside there, I'm going to use the router method. And then I'm just going to simply say module.export router. And now I can just simply go inside index.js and I can start specifying what this route is for. So this is going to contain our register and login routes. And I just have to say app.use. So how do I activate the routes depends on this. So when I hit slash off, then it's going to hit this route. Okay. Okay, so everything is all set up, ready to go. We don't see any errors. So I'm just going to go back inside here and start building the routes. First one is going to be for registering. So I'm going to say router.post. And then inside here, oh, the reason it's post, by the way, is because I want to add data. I want to add someone new within our database. So I'm going to say async because I want to have cool tools to do asynchronous requests. Try catch, <clears throat> errors, console.error, error.message. And then I'm going to set in uh, our status code over here. So if it turns out, uh, if there's something wrong, it means that we have a server error. So that just simply means we have to set a status code of 500. So I'm just going to say res.status500 and say send server error. All right, so we'll just keep it that way. Now let's start building the actual real meat. So inside here, what we're going to contain is step number one. So I'm going to break this into many steps. Step number one, and keep in mind this has nothing to do with GWT yet, okay? So step number one is the structure, the request.body, 
So we're going to get the name, we're going to get the email, and we're going to get the password. So step number two is we're going to check, check if user exists. Now, if the user does exist, so I guess I should add a message. If user exists, then throw error. But if everything ends up working well, then we are going to decrypt the person's. So we're going to decrypt the user's password because remember, we don't want to just plainly put it in our database. And then we're going to enter a new user inside. Oh my God, I can spell inside our database. And then step number five is now generating Rating. Oh, I'll just keep it that way. Whatever. Our JWT token. Okay, so that was that was tough. But anyway, uh, this is really the five steps that we're gonna do for both our register route and our login route. So this is what I mean. So for our destructuring, oh, and also by the way, just a little heads up, I am going to be using something called Postman. Uh, Postman is really just a great way to test your RESTful APIs and build it really quickly. So I have it up right here. As you can see here, I already have sample data set up, but I'll just start with scratch with you guys later. But anyway, um, inside here, I'm going to destructure. So I'm going to structure the request.body because I need to get some data. So what I'm going to destructure is going to be the user, sorry, the name, the email, and then the password, right? That's all I need. And now I need to check whether or not this user exists. So in order to do that, I have to say const user equals to, oops, and I almost forgot this. I have to require that pool because remember, we're going to be using that pool that's going to do all the action for us. So dot slash dot dot slash db. So now that I have that in my hand, I can go inside here. Yeah, I have this error because I have this open ended over there. So I can just say await pool. That's scary. And then I could just run my simple commands. Now, if you're still a little bit confused with this, don't worry, it's going to all come together. Essentially, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to like select all users and I'm going to see whether or not this user exists already. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say select all from users. So that's the user tables. Now I'm going to do the where clause. Again, I like to say this, but if you are confused of what's happening, then like I said, just look at my Pern stack to do list tutorial. It really clears up all of these commands that I'm using. But anyway, select all from user. I'm going to use the word clause to specify. So I'm going to do user email and I'm going to set that to dollar sign one because it's going to be my variable for the second argument. And inside there, I am going to put email. So we have this thing over here and I'm just going to do res.json, this user. So you guys can see it. Oh no, not McAfee. Get away, please. I'm trying to do a tutorial. Okay, but anyway, um, I'm just gonna open up Postman. Oh my God. Okay, yeah, it's out now. Okay, so now I'm gonna open this user that rose and I'm gonna open my Postman so we can get this thing started. So I am going to hit, now you rest that Jason that? Yeah. So I'm gonna say HTTP slash slash localhost 5000 off register and remember i need to put some data within my request that body so i am going to make a post request and i'm going to go to my body and i'm going to go to raw and finally json so i'm going to create a json object which is going to contain my data so side here i'm going to contain name um let's try someone new like jacob then I'm going to add email to to at gmail.com. If you guys get that reference, that's awesome. But anyway, password. And then I'm going to say KTHL822. Okay, so this is the data that's going to be sent. And we're going to check whether or not this user does exist. So if I click enter, seems like this route has not found. And it's probably because I didn't specify this correctly. Yep, because I didn't even see register. Uh, don't forget to say slash register because we want to make sure that this is the register route. Now, if I click enter, 
status code 200, and you can see indeed that our rows is empty, which is a good sign because it means that the user doesn't exist. So if I were to actually do this, for example, so remember we added a user inside there, like we have this user right here. If I decide to put like the email of that one, like henryly213 at gmail.com, and I click enter, you're going to see that what we get is a user insight there. And that's not good if we're trying to register someone because we don't want to duplicate two of the same exact people. All right. So I'm going to change this back over here. And now that we have this all set up, now I know what to do. So with that logic in mind, what I'm going to do is remember, I have to use the if statement. If user exists, then throw error. So if user that rows that length is does not equal to zero. That means that a user already exists and that's not good for us. So what we're going to simply do is we're going to return res.status 401. Okay, so what is 401 and what is 403? Like those are the two main status codes that I'm going to be using a lot. Essentially 401 means that the person is unauthenticated and then 403 is used for like authorization if there's like false, if they're not authorized to enter that data even have like the stack over overflow posts over here and it's like a, a topic that's confused by a lot of people but as you can see here that people is a general known that people like to define 401 as unauthenticated and then using 403 as unauthorized okay so just keep that in mind uh where was i at sure i just totally forgot what i was going to do oh yeah let's go back to the application okay so i'm going to do a rest status 401 and then i'm going to dot send and I'm just going to simply say that user already exists. Okay. So let's look at that. So if I go back here again and I decide to use Henry Lee 213, it's going to throw me an error that says user exists. So if I said enter, so that's a good sign. 401 unauthorized. Yeah, uh, screw it. I don't know. I know they actually say the status code like that, but it, it's a general rule, or at least a lot of people agree on that. 401 should be unauthenticated and then 403 should be used as unauthorized. Okay, so just remember that. Uh, of course, it really depends on your business or what type of company you're working for, but generally I like to think about it that way. Anyway, user already exists, so we get this error over there. So now we want to make sure that if the user doesn't exist, then we can actually continue the process, which is step number three, four, and five. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to jacob22 at gmail.com. Okay. Now that I have this set up, let's go down here. So that means the user is definitely unique. So now we want to start decrypting the user's password. Okay. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say const salt rounds. So this is the amount of times this thing is going to like how like how encrypted it's going to be. Basically, you guys can read the documentation too if you want. So it's going to say constant round equals to 10. And then, you know what, actually, how about I just get the documentation out so you guys can look at it. So uh, let me just get this up for you. I think this is also good practice because um, if you're especially if you're someone who's just trying to get into reading documentation, uh, it's well worth the skill because then you can go through things faster than just watching tutorial. So if you can see inside here, this is essentially what I'm doing. I'm setting a salt round and essentially I use the salt round to gen salt and then I hash it with my plain password. So it's not gonna look like this because we're using callback functions. We're gonna be using a wait. So I say const salt rounds equals to 10. Then I'm gonna say const, uh, let's say gen salt is going to equal to bcrypt. And then I'm going to get that salt rounds over there. Oh, you know what? I don't know why I call it gen salt. I'll just simply call it salt. So bgrip.gensalt, salt rounds. So what I defined over there. And then what I'm going to do next is that, oh, sorry. And this also takes some time. So I have to do a wait. So I'm going to say consult rounds equals to 10, consult equals to wait bgrip.gensalt, salt rounds. And then this is where I start encrypting it. So I'm going to say bgrip password. And I'm going to simply say, And then I'm just going to put in the password, which, where was it called again? So remember I destructure it, so I'm going to put in password inside there. All right, so I'm going to put my password. 
And then I'm going to put my soul inside there. And this is going to give me a bcrypt password. So it's going to be encrypted now. So once this is all done, now as you can see here, we move on to step number four, where we enter the new user inside our database. So this is what we're going to do next. We're going to, um, uh, shoot, I just had a brain fart. Yes, so we're going to put that user inside. So const new user, and we're going to say await pool dot query. So remember we had the insert command. So insert into users table, and then we're going to specify where we want to enter inside there. So in this case, we want to enter within the username. We also want to enter within the user email, and then also the user password. Okay. And then we have to set values. So this is kind of where things get a little bit interesting. So when we get inside here, what values we're going to specify is dollar sign one, dollar sign two, and dollar sign three, and we specify it all in this array. So that's going to be name, that's going to be email, and then finally, that's not going to be password, it's going to be bcrypt password. Because remember, we want to store the encrypted password instead. So I'm going to put it inside there, and oh, you know what, I should just close this since we already have the idea. But yeah, so I'm going to encrypt this user, it's going to add the new user inside there. And then, um, yeah, so at this point where we completed about four steps, and then the last step is being able to generate a JWT token. But let's just kind of stop here and just see like what's going on right now and see whether or not we are able to add a new user. So if I say post and I click enter, I have a server error. Oh no, bcrypt is not defined. Okay. Yep, so that's what we forgot to do bcrypt equals to require bcrypt. Good thing we tested that out. Okay. And to ensure that we don't fall for any errors or this thing doesn't keep going, I'm just going to simply say res.json new user. And don't forget to do returning star. Uh, the reason for that is because it's going, we want to return the data back to us so we can analyze it. So I'm going to say new user and I'm going to say dot rows first item. So let's see whether or not a new user is going to be saved within our database. So like you said, or like I remember, this thing does not exist yet. So if I click enter, we are able to save our user inside there. Oh shoot, what is this? User password. Oh, <laughs> we saved the object instead. Okay, so it is working, but our password is a little bit janky. That's not right. So the, oh, you know why? Because it takes some time. We have to wait for this data to actually be saved. So let's try this again. So let's just make sure. <clears throat> yeah, so we indeed have a new user, but <clears throat> delete from users where I, I guess username equals to Jacob. Okay, let's try that. Oops, I have to do quotations. Yeah, let's try this again. Okay, so now if we go back inside here, and we tried to register this user again, so I deleted him. So we click enter. Look at that. We are able to save our users. Okay, so remember, the reason why asynchronous is so important and why we use async and await is because it actually does take time to do these type of functions. Okay, so nice. We are able to successfully save a user in the database. So in the next section, we're going to move to the fifth step, which is going to do, I can't talk, which we're going to generate our JWT token. Okay, so I'll see you then. Okay, so let's start generating this stuff. So in order to generate a JWT token, what I'm going to first do is, oh, and I almost forgot about this, but if we are going to make a JWT token, we're going to have to have a secret. So one of the libraries I'm going to need to download, so you guys can open this up, cd into server, and then just npm install .emd. Okay, so that's what we're going to need in order for this thing to function because we need that secret. So I'm just going to go open new files, call it .emv, and as usual, I'm going to name it that very lame secret. Okay, so awesome. Now that that's all set up and ready to go, uh, let's start building our function. So I'm going to create a new folder called utils. So this is going to carry all my functions and new file that's going to be called JWT generator. Okay, so it's not as complicated as you think it is. So all we have to first do is we're going to say const JWT equals to require 
JSON Web Token. And then the last thing we need to do is since we already have that thing downloaded, they require .env and then I'm going to say .config. So I'm going to run that function over there. So this is going to allow us to get access to all our environment variables. Okay. So now that that's all set up, oops, seems like my computer is lagging a little bit. Uh, so I'll kind of get back to you guys, but uh, this shouldn't take too long. Okay, so hopefully things are a lot less laggy now, so things should start functioning. So we're going to start creating a function. I'm going to call it function JWT generator. And inside here, there's going to be two things I'm going to do. I got to create the payload. I'm going to say const payload. And this is simply going to take, it's going to call a user, and it's going to take that data that's being sent inside there. So I'll call a user ID, and I'll just display it as user ID. So I'm going to set user to user ID. All right. And then the last thing we need to do is that we need to sign the token. So I'm going to say JWT.sign. What it's going to do is it's going to take my payload data, and it's also going to take in my secret. So process .jwt secret. And then it's going to have expiration date. So expires in. So there's many ways you can do this. It does it by seconds. So if you want to represent one hour, you can simply say like 60 times 60. So this is seconds, so that will result into one hour. Or if you're like me, I just simply like using the text. So I just say one hour. Of course, you can make this as long as you want, depending on how you want to build this application. But for now, I'm just going to keep it like this. OK, so that's really all it takes. So I'm just going to simply return all of this because it's a function. And then I'm going to just say module.exports. And I'm going to say JWT generator. Awesome. So now I'm going to go inside my JWT off. And I'm going to apply to there, but I have to first require it. So I'm going to say const my JWT generator homemade require. And it's going to do dot slash. and then it's going to go to JWT generator and now I can start using it. So inside here, I'm going to say const token is going to equal to JSON web token. I'm sorry, JWT generator and I'm going to insert that data now. So I'm going to say new user. So this is coming from here. So I'm getting data from new user. Remember, we have to access that rows, the first item, and now I can access that user ID. All right. So now that we have this all set up, all we have to do to left is just do res res dot json, and then I'm going to put in my token inside there. So I do control s. Now we are going to see whether or not this actually does work. So I'm going to open my where is it at? I'm going to open my Postman. So we are starting with a clean start, and I'm just going to go to HTTP slash slash localhost. 5000 slash off slash register like this one. We're going to make a post request. So we're going to have a new user inside here. So let's just go back to raw. We need to JSON. Inside here, I'm going to have a name of, uh, so let's call it name of uh, Jesse. And then we're going to have a email. Let's call girl at gmail.com. And then we're going to have a password that's going to be uh, KTHL22, right? So we're going to see whether or not we actually do get a token. So, oops, no, I don't want to get rid of it. So if I click enter, let's just hope it works. Oh, yeah. Look at that. We get a token. And this token is being defined as token because we define it like that over there. So awesome. So yeah, that's all it really takes to just building our first route. And the login route is exactly the same steps with just a, a tiny bit of changes, but it's overall the same. So in the next section, we're going to start working on the login route. So I'll see you then. Okay, so let's just start jumping into the login route. So what I'm going to do is going to say router that post. And let me just add a comment over here that's going to say login route okay and inside here i'm going to say router.post because we're still trying to add data call login 
And inside here, I'm just going to say async request.res. Same exact procedure as last time. What? And I'm just going to take all this data right there. Okay, so the login route is a little bit different from the register route. We're going to be using a lot more bcrypt. Okay, so what we're going to first do is that step number one. That's a little bit strange. Oh, sorry, wrong one. So we're going to start doing uh, step number one. We are going to destructure the request.body. Step number two is, is that we are going to uh, check if user doesn't exist. And if not, then we throw error. Okay. Now step number three. So this one is where it starts to divert and be a little bit different. Now, if it does end up existing, then we're going to check whether or not the person that posted the password is the same as the password within our database. So now check if both passwords, no, check if incoming password is the same as the database password, okay? And then finally, step number four is, is that if we pass all the tests, then what is left is that we're going to give them the JWT token. Okay, so these are the four steps that we're going to do. So let's do it. So we're going to say cons, not coons, and we're going to say name. Sorry, we don't even need names because remember, when we're logging in, all the data we are requiring is the email and the password. And we're going to set that to request that body. Now that we have that all set up, now we are going to check cons users await pull that query, and we're going to say select select all from users and we're going to say where user email is going to be equal to the other time one and we're going to define email right there all right so now i'm going to move this down a little bit more so if it turns out the user doesn't exist so if users.rows first item oh sorry not first item if user.rows.length ends up equaling to zero, that means a user doesn't exist. And that's problematic because we need it to exist in order to log in. So what I'm going to say is that I'm going to return res that status 500, not 500, 401 for unauthorized. And then I'm going to say, oh, sorry, not unauthorized on, sorry, I had to be careful unauthenticated. Okay. And then I'm going to say that send User, uh, you know what? I think it's better if I just simply say uh, password or email is incorrect. I should say that. Password or email is incorrect. Is there any way or not I should do this as a JSON data? Yeah, let's set it up as a JSON. Yeah, let's just do dot send. I'll just keep it that way. No. I think I'm going to keep it as JSON data, so I'll just take it in. It really doesn't matter. Okay, so now that I have this all set up now, I'm going to throw the error. But if it ends up, everything is okay. Then we're going to now check whether or not the person's incoming password is the same as the database password. So this is kind of where bcrypt becomes our, our big boy. So what we're going to say is that we're going to say cons, and we're going to check if it has a valid password. So we're going to say valid password. I'm going to say bcrypt.compare. What I am going to compare is the current password that's going to be coming in. And then I'm going to compare it with the user's password. So I'm going to say user.rows first item. And I'm going to say dot user password. So remember, we encrypt it. So we need to use bcrypt again to double check if it is the same. And this is going to return a Boolean of whether or not it's true or false. Okay, so if it turns out that everything ends up being okay, then we're going to continue with the process. So if a valid password, you know what, just to make it a little bit easier so you guys know what's coming out of this, I'll just say console.log valid password. Anyway, we need to start testing our application to see if it does work. So, whoa, where is it at? I'm going to go over to login. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply use the same exact data. 
and hopefully I can get my boolean to see whether or not it's true or false. Okay, so I'm going to enter. And I'm going to go to here. Let's see what data we get. It's a promise. Sorry, I almost forgot to tell you that bcrypt takes some time to work with. So we're going to say wait. Okay, awesome. Okay, now let's try this one more time. Okay, it's true. Awesome. So all we have to do is we need to check whether or not it's false. So all we have to say is if not valid password, then what we're going to do is we're going to say again, once again, we're going to say return res that status of 401. And then we're going to say JSON password or email is incorrect. Did I say that? I hope I said it in the same one. Yeah, there we go. Keep it consistent. Okay, awesome. Okay, and then like if everything ends up passing the test and all we have to do is generate the GWT token. So it's just the same exact process, but we just have to do GWT generator. And then we just have to take in the user, that rows, first item, and their user ID. And that's all we need to use. And then I just have to simply say res.json token. Right, so it seems that everything is going to work. Let's see if I mess up anything. I think it's working pretty well. So if this is the right user and I click enter, we should get a JWT token. And cool, look at that. Now we got JWT token, awesome. Okay, so uh, we pretty much finished the big routes. Uh, the rest are pretty not too bad. All we have to do now is start working on our middleware where we need to make sure that the person that is trying to access a private route is going to be able to have a valid like JWT token. So I'll see you guys in the next section. All right, so you guys are doing great. As you can see, what we have here is that we created a register a login route. And after following a lot of the steps that we set up, we, at the end of the day, created a JWT generator function that's going to generate us a JWT token. And then we send it back to the client side. Okay, so now the client has access to this JWT token. So now, every time they're making a fetch or access request to get access to a private area, they're going to have to show that token to us. So what we need to do next is create a middleware that's going to check whether or not that token that's being given to us is valid. So in case it's still a little bit confusing, what I have here is just to show you what's happening. So as you can see, whenever we log in or we're registering, we're going to be giving them this token over here. So they have access to this token. And now whenever they want to access, for example, the dashboard, they're going to have to show that token to us in our, in our server side. So we need to create a middleware that's going to take this token and to make sure that it is valid. Because like I said, remember, people can just totally go inside here, write token, and then they can write like their own, like their own, their own little code over there, even though it can be fake. All right, so let's do that. So what I'm going to do is I am going to create a new folder called middleware. Inside there, I am going to create a new file that's going to be called, um, Let's call it authorization. The reason I'm calling it authorization is because I want to make it clear that we're using this middleware to authorize the person. So to create a middleware, we need to have two parts. We have to say module that exports. And then inside here, I'm going to make this asynchronous. And we just have to run our functions request, res, and then we have this next over there. So what is this? Essentially what it's doing is that before it even hits our routes, it's going to get access to the request res. And then if everything ends up working okay, we're going to just continue on with the process of next so it can keep going with the routes. All right, so I'll explain this a little bit more as we go more in depth with this. So I'm going to say console.error.message. Error and inside here, if there ends up being an error, that means what we're going to return back is rest that status of 403 because they're unauthorized. And then I'm going to JSON by saying that you are not authorized. All right, I'm just gonna keep it that simple. Now inside here with our little business logic, we are going to be doing, I think like about three steps. So the first step is that we need to destructure whatever is inside the, uh, yeah, we need to destructure the token. We need to get the token from the fetch request. 
So we're going to call this const JWT token, and the token is going to be sent inside the request header. So we're going to say request.header. So this may look a little bit confusing, but that's because we haven't touched the client side quite yet. But essentially, the token is going to be inside here. So once you have access to that token, we're going to first check whether or not the token does exist. So if it turns out that there's no JWT token, that is like a straightforward answer that we are not authorized to even enter inside there. So we're going to return res.status 43.json, and I'm just going to repeat the process by saying not authorized. All right. Okay, so the next step is, is that if they do end up having a JWT token, so remember in my case, I do have a JWT token, but it's extremely fake. So we need to check whether or not it is valid. So we're going to say const. So this looks a little bit weird, but I'm going to call this payload. And then I'm going to say JWT.verify. Oh, I just forgot I didn't even bring out those things. So we are going to require some libraries. I'm going to say const JWT equals to require JSON web token. And then I'm also going to need that secret because remember how I said the secret is the key into unlocking of whether or not it is valid or not. So what I'm going to go inside is going to say require dot env and then I'm going to run the method config so I can access to the environment variables. Okay, so now, like I said, the cool thing about JWT is that it provides this nice method and it's just one line that's going to tell us whether or not the JWT token is valid. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in two arguments. The first one is going to be the JWT token that's being given to us. And the second thing is our secret. And that's all. So you may be wondering, why did I name this payload? So I want to make this very transparent. The idea is, is that if it turns out that this is verified, it is going to return us a payload that we can use within our routes. So that's why with this payload, now we can say request.user equals to payload.user. Because if you remember inside our JWT generator, we had to create a payload and we set this like this uh, key called user with the value of user ID, which we got from the function. So by doing so, we'll be able to actually put that object within the request.user object so we can access it within our routes, all right? And that's pretty much all we have to do. That's all. Okay, so the next middleware that I want to be able to create is a valid info middleware. So I was determining whether or not we should use Happy Joy or Express Validator, but instead of actually doing so, since we're working with a small application, I thought it would be a good idea to just have a little bit more practice with middleware. Now, I'm not going to like write the code out of scratch. I am going to copy and paste it. And you can do the same thing inside the GitHub repository that I'm going to provide below the video. But the basic idea is, is that it's going to check whether or not our email is valid or not. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys an explanation of what I'm going to copy and paste. So I'm going to open this thing up, my other code. You can see I have it all already set up. So I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to spit it inside here. So what is going on here? So it's not as complicated. You can see it's not that much. So currently it has the same structure as any middleware where you have this function. And just to keep this consistent, I'm just going to make this an error function as well. Essentially, it's going to destructure our email name and password because it has also access to the request.body. And then we have this nice looking function that's going to check whether or not the email is valid. So we have this regex over here, and it's going to turn whether or not this email is following this regex pattern. Now, inside here, we divide this into two parts because we are focusing more on the register and login route. So if it ends up going to register, <clears throat> what we're going to be checking is whether or not there's no empty values because we don't want to add empty values inside our application. So what we're going to do is that we're going to check whether or not email, name, or password. We're going to loop through this array and we're going to check whether or not it's empty. So this is a neat little trick that you can do over there. And then if it turns out that there is actually empty value or any of these are empty, we're just going to return missing credentials, which I just realized I need to add some status code. So status 403, right? For on we actually, sorry, it's going to be 401 because they're on author, unauthenticated. There you go. Okay, so next for this one right here, if it turns out that all values are all filled up, then we're going to check whether or not an email is valid. So that's kind of where this function comes in. So we put that function over here. It's going to return a true or false statement. And if it turns out that the valid email is not valid after all, we are going to rest on JSON invalid email. 
which once again, I am just going to add this really quick. So status of 401 because they're unauthenticated. All right. Okay, so now this is the same exact procedure, except we're going to be hitting the login route. So instead of actually trying to get email name and password, we're just trying to access the email and password. So we're going to run the same exact stuff to see whether or not anything is empty. And then if it turns out any of them are empty, we're going to rest.json missing credentials. I'm just going to do this again. And then we're going to do the same exact logic as you saw right there, where we're going to check whether or not the email is valid or not. And that's pretty much all we have to do. So it's not as bad. It's not that bad. All right. And if you are a little bit confused, don't worry about it because we're going to be testing this thing out. So if you want to take the time, you guys can totally copy and paste the GitHub code put it inside here. Now, as you can see here, we have this next. So the big idea of next is that once everything completes and everything's OK, it's going to continue on with the route. <clears throat> OK, so oh my God, my voice. <laughs> Okay, so what we're going to be doing is that we're going to go into Postman and we're going to test this thing out. So I'm going to go over to JWT off and I'm going to take in that middleware. So this is what this middleware is going to do. We're going to say const valid info require. And it's going to say dot dot slash into the utils, sorry, in the middleware. And I am going to try to get the valid info. And this is all we have to do. I'm going to go to my register and I'm going to put valid info in the middle of this. All right, so pretty simple. And I'm going to apply this to the login as well. I think you guys are starting to understand why it's called middleware because it sits right in the middle of the route. All right, so now that that's all set up and ready to go, uh, let's kind of test this thing to see whether or not it does end up working. So I'm going to try to register a new user. I'm going to say post http slash slash localhost 5000 slash off slash register and then i just need to create a, a new user over here so i'm going to do raw json so the name is going to be jackie and then the email is going to be chan at gmail.com and then we are going to add a password and just to keep it consistent, I'm going to call it KTHL AAT2. All right. So let's see whether or not this actually does end up working. So I do want to make an empty value first. So let's see if this works for us. So as you can see, it says missing credentials. Oh, it's okay. So awesome. So it's working. So let's say we do end up putting a correct, e we would put a correct name, but let's say we do a really janky looking email. Let's say we don't even have this. Like it's just a bunch of fake emails. Let's see what it does. And it says invalid email. Awesome. So if we do end up putting this valid email, you're going to quickly see that it will start working. So if I click enter, you see the status of 200. And as a result, we get our token, right? Because you registered a new user. So yeah, that's pretty much all it takes to creating a middleware. So uh, just a little preview again. What we did is that we created authorization middleware, which is going to take in that JWT token that's coming from the fetch header. And we're going to check whether or not it's valid or not before we access the uh, private routes. And then you can see right here that we have this valid info, which is just going to simply check that we're sending valid information to our register and login route. So in the next section, we're going to finish our last two routes. OK, so I'll see you guys then. All right. OK, so let's finish up this RESTful API and just kind of get this thing moving on to the client side. So the big idea is that we're going to be building two routes. We already did the big ones, but the next one we're going to build is a route that's going to consistently verify the JWT token whenever the React application is refreshed. And then the this, uh, sorry, the fourth route is going to be the area where we're going to access private information. So remember when we went to the dashboard, we had to get we had to make a request to get the name of the person. So let me just give you guys an example of why we need that first route, which is going to verify the JWT token. So if I go to my demo, yeah, if I go to my demo over here and I get back into where is it at? App.js. So this is a little sneak peek of what our dashboard is going to look like. But the big idea is that it's going to make a request. I'm not sure why this is a post request, but it's going to make a request to auth verify. 
And this is going to check whenever the person is still verified or if they're authenticated. So it's going to hit that route and it's going to return us a true or false statement. And this is as a result will lead us to setting the state to true or false and whether or not they are authenticated or not. So the reason why the state is super important is because it is the one that tells like which components we can access. So in this case, we can't access dashboard if the person is not authenticated, which I'll explain this later on. Now, the thing is, is that anytime you're refreshing a React application, it is going to reset the state. So if we didn't have this thing over here, that meant that by default, anytime we refresh the React application, it was going to be set to false. So even if we were authenticated and we did have a proper GWT token, it will still lead us back into the login or register page, not giving us access to the dashboard. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. And like I said, again, uh, we're going to build a client side and that will make a lot more sense. Anyway, let's go back into our application over here. And uh, let me go back to here and we're going to start building this route. So inside here, I'm going to say router dot get. It shouldn't be a post actually because we're not adding any data and I'm going to call it is verified. And inside here, I'm going to say async request res. So regular procedure, try catch. And I'm just going to take the same exact thing and I'm just going to print it over here so we don't reinvent the wheel. OK, so the next thing we need is that we're going to have that middleware that we created. So I'm going to say cons authorization equals require slash middleware authorization. So remember, the thing about this authorization is that it's going to check whether or not the token that's being sent to us is valid. So this is going to do most of the work for us. And this is why this route is super simple, because now what we're going to do is that we're going to take this middleware. We're going to put it in the middle of this route. And then if it turns out that this passes the test, if it turns out the token is valid, that means for sure that the person for association must be true. So we're just going to return back a true statement. OK. This is all we're going to be doing. And this is really all the route it takes to build it. So now if I go to my postman and I were to test this thing out, so let's kind of get rid of all of this. Don't save. Yeah, let me just clean this up really quick because there's just too much going on here. Don't want to overwhelm you guys with all these tabs I have. <laughs> okay, let's just get rid of all of these things. Okay, so as you can see here, we need to be able to get a token in order to make this thing work. So I just registered a random user. So in this case, you might want to do it again because remember we set an expiration date. So if you are finding that your application or token is not working, it means that you need to create, you need to refresh yourself back again inside there, or you need to log in and register once again. So I'm just going to refresh this really quick and I'm going to take my token. And now I'm going to go into here go to localhost 5000 off is vertified and I'm going to make this a get request and I'm going to set my header. So not body. I'm going to go to header. I'm going to set something called token and then I'm going to put my value inside there. So I'm just going to go inside and replace it with that new JW token that was given to me. And then it should return me back to true. So let's test this. Look at that. So we get a true statement. And look, if I just change one small thing, so if I change this one to a two, it's going to say that I'm not authorized. Look at that, because it's an invalid algorithm. Oh, OK, that's a little strange. But basically, all you need to understand is that the thing about this is that if it's, it's going to check whether or not it's valid or not. But if it does end up passing the test, if it passes as middleware, then we're just going to simply return back to true. So I'll just change this number back to one. So now it should start working once again. OK, so back to true. So awesome. Uh, so we finished that route. I think the last one we need to start creating is going to be our dashboard route. So we're going to create a new file called dashboard.js. And we're going to just simply do the regular procedure of cons, cons router require router, sorry, express dot router. And then inside here, we're just going to do module the exports router. And then I'm just going to simply go inside my index.js and I'm going to make a new route called dashboard route. And it's going to say app.use slash dashboard. 
and then I'm going to require that. All right, cool. Okay, so let's just make sure we don't get any errors. So everything's working properly. So what does it take to get the dashboard? Well, there's a few things we're going to need. We need to have that pool. So it's going to be from dot dot slash db. And then we're also going to need to have that middleware. So authorization equals to require dot dot slash middleware and then authorization. Okay, so let's start building this. So it's going to be a router.get because we're not going to be adding data. We're just trying to get data. I'm just going to leave it as a slash because it's going to say slash dashboard slash. And then I'm going to put in that middleware because I want to make sure that the person is authorized to access their data. And then I'm going to say async request.res. Do the regular procedure. So console.error.message. And then I'm just going to simply say res.status of 500 n.json server error. All right. Okay, so what do we do inside here? Well, it's basically just the same thing as any other application to getting data. All I'm going to simply say is I'm going to say const users. Oh, you know, what? and I almost forgot to tell you guys this because you guys may still be a little bit confused. Remember, inside here, this authorization by passing through we're able to access the request.user object to access the user's ID information. So if I go back inside, uh oh, save, I guess. Okay, hopefully that didn't do anything wrong. Oh no, okay. <laughs> I knew there was something that was gonna mess up. Okay, let's go back inside here because I think I already saw the problem. Everything should start working now. Okay, so I'm gonna X this thing out. Let's go back into the middleware. And look at this. Remember, if the token is valid, it's going to set request that user and it's going to take the payload and we're going to set that payload to that user over there. All right, because now we have access to the data. So I can go back inside my dashboard and just to make it make a little bit more sense, I'm going to say res.json request.users. Remember, after passing this middleware, the request.users has the payload. Okay, just remember that. So I'll just make a new route. I'm going to say HTTP slash slash localhost 5000 slash off slash um, certified. Oops, sorry. That doesn't exist. And it's going to be get request. And we also need to get this token. So I'll just copy this thing right here. I'm going to go back in here, go to headers, set token to this data. Oh no, what is that? Snakes. Okay, so I guess I'm just going to do the old fashioned way. So I'm going to paste inside here. And now if we click enter, we're going to see what this request that user is. And I just realized that that's a little bit strange. It's because I'm hitting the wrong route. Okay. Okay, now if I click enter. Man, today is just not my day. Oh, that's because I just wrote it wrong. Okay, so now it's okay. There you go. Whew. Okay, that that was a long process. But as you can see here, I get this random string of ID. So hopefully this looks familiar because this is the UUID that we created. So if we look inside our database, and I let me make this look a little nicer for you guys. But as you can see here, this ID is coming. So let's kind of see if we can look for this. Let's see where the 009 come from. Should be coming around here. You know what? And let's kind of put our JavaScript or our Postgres to the test. Let's just simply say, I'm just going to go out here and I'm going to say select all from users where user ID is going to equal to this string over here. So remember, it has to be single quotation. So this might not work. So we have to change it to single quotations. And I'm going to add a semicolon and now let's click enter and look at that. This is the user that we're getting. Remember, it's Jacob. And then we get this user ID over there. All right. So now with that in mind, we can utilize this to get data about that person. So I'm going to go inside here. I'm just going to do this. And I'm going to simply say const users is going to equal to await pull.query. And I'm going to run that same command that I wrote, select 
all from users where user ID equals to dollar sign one. And as you guessed, it's going to be request.user. Right? Because remember that request that user contains this data over there. So once I get that user, all I can simply do is return back to the client side res.json user dot rows first item. All right, so now if everything works out to plan, if we click enter, we should get the user back. And we do. Okay, so this is where things get really important. Look, we don't have to give off everything. It's really important that we don't pass in our password because we don't want to put that in public. So we can be specific on what type of data we want to pass in. So what I'm going to pass in is just simply the user name. So now, if I click enter, you're going to see that we just get the username. All right, so that's pretty much all it takes uh, to build this backend application. So right after this one, I'm just going to give you guys a quick overview of what we just did, and then we'll move on to the client side. So I'll see you guys then. Okay, so let's kind of do a quick review of what we just did in this RESTful API. Okay, so um, I want you guys to go inside this route over here, and we're going to check out JWT off. So inside here, what we did was we created a authentication system with our register and login route. So remember, authentication has nothing to do with JWT. Okay, so what we're simply doing is that we are breaking it down into five steps for registering. We destructure the request.body. We check if the user exists, as you can see here. And if the user doesn't exist, then if the user does exist, sorry, for register, then we're going to say user already exists. And then we're going to encrypt the password. And then we are going to insert the new user into our database. And as a result, we're going to generate our JWT token. Okay, and the process still kind of goes the same way of login. The basic idea is that instead of actually checking whether or not user exists, if we check if a user doesn't exist, then we're going to throw an error, right? But anyway, they're both going to generate a JWT token. So this JWT token gives the client access to access our private routes within our application. So as you can see here, within our JWT function that we created here, if I can find it, you can see that all we do is that we take a user ID, we create a payload out of this, and then we sign it. So we say JWT.sign payload, we take in the secret, and then we set an expiration date. Okay, so that's all we have to do. And then we return that data over there and we get it back in JWT off and that's going to be sent off to the client side. Okay, there we go. Now, how are we able to see whether or not that JWT token is valid? So this is kind of where the middleware comes in. If you look inside our dashboard over here, you can see that we have to have this authorization middleware to, set, to check whether or not the JWT token is valid. So by passing through this, as you can see here, it is going to take or check the header to see whether or not a token does exist. If it doesn't exist, then we're going to say not authorized. But otherwise, we're going to set this as the payload. If everything works out well, we're going to verify it with that JWT verify method. And then we're going to set request that user object to the payload that user object. And now with that, we have access to using that user ID within our application, as you can see right here. So how cool is that? Okay, so yeah, that's pretty much all we did. Those are like the big pictures of what we did. And uh, of course, you guys are always feel, you always can look into the GitHub application and just look at what's happening. So I do want to give you guys a heads up, though, that I am going to split this video into two parts because I realized that I talk a lot when it comes to theoretical things. So in the second part, we're going to work on the client side, but I should be uploading this part uh, probably pretty soon. OK, so anyway, congratulations, you guys. Also, you guys can look at the GitHub to just kind of get a heads up what the client side is going to look like. So I'll see you guys then.